Richard's point of view, it's nice not to be blamed for everything in life. Um, but here's the, the question for all of us as we go into the number of conversations that we will have bilaterally or in panel sessions about that very core matter that um, Madam President brought up about trust, that it is not a given, it is earned. So when we look at the fact that we are talking about let's heal the world together, this entire conversation is going to be broken up into two topical clusters, recovering from the great lockdown and building resilient societies. How do we do that if we are dealing with a world where you have question marks about every institution that talks at this point? How do you intend to communicate with your stakeholders and ensure that they believe you. I think that is the core of the questions that we're going to be talking about, asking of, of every participant, and also the thought processes of every single person who takes part online. Give us your ideas. Solution seeking is what we're here for, and that should be the very core and theme of what we should be thinking about. GlobeSec um, has been innovating this entire conference to ensure that the conversations have participation, not just from a, the, the handful that are allowed to be in this room, but from across the world, whether they're in Asia, in the US, or here in Europe. Those of us who were willing to take the 14-day lockdown when we go back into, uh, or the quarantine when we go back into our respective countries, and if you don't have that, you are very, very lucky. But these conversations are critical for building that trust. The trust element that we have to talk about is another aspect of this hybrid conference, but we have to talk about brainstorming as well. Um, at this point, we are going to be speaking with uh, the World Health Organization as soon as we can get that technical link up. Remember what I told you when technology is about iteration and we're trying to solve for things? Uh, right now, I am literally making sure that we can get that link up and speak to the person who's at the very heart of this entire conference conversation has been since we found out about uh, the COVID virus um, back in December out of China. As we await for that link to come up, I do want to ask uh, if anyone has any concerns to make sure that you speak to the GlobeSec organizers. Robert is sitting right there, so grab him if it's a really high level question. Um, and if you can't make out, he is uh, wearing a green lanard. And uh, please wave out, Robert just so that everyone knows you are sitting in that room. So any questions about anything critically important, go to him. Otherwise, the GlobeSec staff are walking around waiting for your questions to be answered. The uh, quick bit that Steve and I forgot to mention um, about this hybrid conference is that for 15 years, this conference has been ensuring that we have these conversations. Again, I'm going to reiterate to you about the questions that are, are asked. Keep them short because technology will always somehow let us down at inopportune moments like right now, where we are waiting for Tedros to, uh, and his link to be put up. In the meantime, um, if anyone has any question, uh, so we have... Um, as we have a technical problem with bringing the WHO online, whoever knew that would happen, we are going to move on to a session that is going to set the stage for the conversation with the WHO, which would be the COVID session. If I can get Veronica to get up here and bring her panel on stage. Okay. Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Veronika Cifrova Ostrihonova, and I will be moderating the health panel, concentrating on the global pandemic and the lessons learned and looking to the future. We are still waiting for the I Director General of the vote. WHO, who should be joining us shortly. But I think before we begin, we might call our first guest, I guess, because what will we be doing here? So hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Hope you're all being safe. I'm sure you are because... And now I can officially welcome Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who's going to speak to us. Hey. 
I hear you have some remarks for us. Oh, this is the virtual GlobSec, so we need to be patient, just like the first two moderators said. The technology is living its own life, but we see Yes, so I'm, I'm waiting until you invite me. Am I now? Hi, Director General. You are online. We see you. And welcome to the panel. We are glad to hear your remarks. Thank you. Da quiem. Oh, very good Slovak. <laughs> That's a very impressive. Excellencies. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have many friends, so they taught me that at least. <laughs> Excellencies, esteemed colleagues and friends, good morning and thank you for the invitation to share a few reflections today about the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons it's teaching us. As you know, more than 35 million cases of COVID have now been reported to WHO and more than 1 million deaths. All countries have been affected but not all countries have been affected in the same way. 10 countries account for 70% of all reported cases and deaths, and just three countries account for half of it. But even countries that have so far avoided large numbers of cases and deaths have been impacted by the social and economic effects of the pandemic. Societies have been disrupted schools and businesses have been closed and livelihoods have been lost. Even some of the richest and most powerful countries have been overwhelmed. The pandemic is a powerful demonstration that protecting and promoting health is essential for protecting and promoting economic, social and political stability. COVID-19 has exposed and exploited the inequalities in our societies and the gaps in health systems. Pandemics have a particularly heavy impact on women through reduced health service access and greater burdens of care and economic insecurity. Fragile and conflict-affected states have markedly lower preparedness capacities Migrants and refugees have particular health, social, and economic vulnerabilities that are exacerbated during health emergencies. In recent years, many countries have made enormous investments and advances in medicine, but too many have neglected their basic public health systems, which are the bedrock for preventing, preparing, detecting, and responding to outbreaks. Many nations face critical gaps in surveillance, essential medicines, protective equipment, supply chains, infection prevention and control, water, sanitation and hygiene, and the health workforce. The absence of any one of these leaves communities vulnerable and undermines the timely response necessary to contain the pandemic or any health crisis. One of the key lessons of the pandemic is therefore the importance of making political and financial commitments to public health. The time to prepare is before the crisis strikes. We need to fix the roof before the rain comes. A strong health system rooted in primary health care is the foundation for achieving universal health coverage and the trust of the communities it serves. But investing in health is not primarily an economic choice. It is a political choice. Of critical importance in pandemic preparedness is leadership that rises above the national interest to reap the benefits of countries acting together to shore up common defenses. Together with France, the European Commission, the United Kingdom, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we launched the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator in April. 
The ACT Accelerator brings together government, scientists, businesses, civil society, philanthropists, and global health organizations to speed up the development and equitable distribution of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Currently, around 200 vaccines are in different stages of development, including 38 vaccine in human trials. About eight are in the phase, in phase three trials, or are about to start. To stop the pandemic quickly and effectively, the world needs to resist what we call vaccine nationalism. It's natural that governments want to protect their own citizens first. But once a vaccine is approved, production will be limited initially, and we must decide who to prioritize. Vaccinating older people, those with underlying conditions and essential workers in all countries is the best way to suppress transmission everywhere. Restore confidence and accelerate the global economic recovery. And that's why we're saying we need to vaccinate some in all countries rather than all people in some countries. If people in lower income countries miss out on vaccines, the virus will continue to kill and the recovery will be delayed. So sharing and solidarity is in the interest of each and every nation on earth. Following the guidance of WHO's member states, I have initiated three reviews of the international response to the pandemic through the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, the International Health Regulations Review Committee, and the Independent Oversight and Advisory Committee for the WHO Health Emergencies. We look forward to the findings and recommendations of these reviews. But there are several lessons that are already starting us, staring us in the face. First, we must learn from this pandemic and make political and financial commitments now to address critical gaps in national and global preparedness. We must renew our determination as a global community that never again will a new pathogen be allowed to spread with such destructive impact on our populations. The time to prepare for emergencies is before they occur. WHO support for country preparedness is rooted in the idea that the best defense for health emergencies is strong health systems based on universal health coverage and primary health care. So we need to have a real and strong commitment to universal health coverage. We have been, many countries have been saying it for several decades, but still hasn't materialized. Health for all, health for all, health for all. That's the answer. Second, preparedness goes far beyond the health ministry. There must be engagement across sectors, including foreign affairs, finance, water and sanitation, labor, trade, and other sectors. It also demands strong engagement of local government, community leaders, and civil society, especially in urban settings and among the most vulnerable populations. Finally, we have to go beyond our own immediate short-term national interests if we're going to bring this pandemic to an end. The Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator is a global collaboration to catalyze the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines. We call on all countries to contribute to the ACT Accelerator. We are a global community and must support global solutions. No one is safe until everyone is safe. We have said it many times, and we will not be tired to say it again and again. This virus can only be broken through unity. 
can be defeated through unity. As I have said many times, again, keys to defeating this pandemic are unity and solidarity. That's true in families, neighborhoods, and communities, and it's true at the global level. When we act out of self-interest, we provide an opportunity for the virus to spread. When we act in solidarity, the virus can be stopped. The pandemic has exposed and exploited the geopolitical fault lines, inequalities, injustices, and contradictions of our world. Now more than ever, we need national unity and global solidarity to defeat COVID-19 and to heal our world and to build the world we all want, healthier, fairer, and everything that we can ask of the best for this world. I thank you. Thank you to Dr. Thank you to Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who is the Director General of the WHO. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker at this panel of Global Pandemic, who is here in lieu of uh, Minister Krajci, who is uh, the Health Minister of Slovakia. But this is the Secretary of State, Peter Stachura. Welcome. We're very glad you could join us instead of the Minister at last minute. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I let me greet you in the name of Ministry of Health and especially on behalf of Minister Dr. Krajci, who unfortunately can't, couldn't come to this uh, conference because of uh, health condition. And this is for me a big honor to be here and to represent Ministry of Health of Slovak Republic at this meeting. I wish all of you pleasant and helpful conference and stay in Bratislava. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. I just should remind you that we are wearing masks just as a precaution, even though this is a very COVID friendly and safe environment. But we are wearing masks because you are from the ministry and we have other public health experts coming in. So we should be setting an example, right? Yeah, we, we uh, said that we, it is better to, to wear a mask because we are example also for others. And you are representing so, the ministry. Okay. And uh, another thing to idea. remind you, all the people watching us online, you can join in with the questions at uh, Globs. Wait, sorry, I need to go through the website, which is live.globsec.org. And if you are here uh, in the room, please don't hesitate to, answer, to ask questions, but please just stand up, shortly introduce yourself, the microphone will come to you, and please keep your questions brief. We are very pleased to hear from you, but there's limited amount of time. What we want to start with, Mr. Stachura, is uh, the situation on the ground in Slovakia. Because we are in Slovakia, Slovakia is in the state of emergency. The number of cases is steadily going up. The hospitals are starting to fill up to reach and surpass their capacities. There are rescue workers who say they lack protective gear. There's a whole lot of things happening. So my first question is actually a quote from a mathematician, Richard Kolar, who in an interview for the Slovak Daily Denik N said, the current threat is not the collapse of the healthcare system, but rather the harsh measures that we must implement in order to prevent the collapse of the healthcare system. <laughs> is this so? Actually, I can agree that uh, it is a challenge for us, for all of us, because it is not only about uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 when they are positive, but also for other patients with severe conditions, with cancer, with patients on waiting lists and so on. So, I mean, um, for us as a government or Ministry of Health, it's very important to find the right balance between treatment of uh, COVID positive patients and between uh, uh, treatment of uh, other, uh, other patients with severe conditions. So how about the health measures that Mr. Kolar talked about, that the danger is not that the healthcare system will collapse, but that we would have to implement such harsh measures that other people could suffer. So you don't think that this is going to happen because we hear from the hospitals in Slovakia that they have to postpone or cancel elective surgeries, elective treatments, that um, there's a lot happening. 
do you think that will stand the chance of not winning, but at least playing even with the pandemic also regarding the other patients, the other people in Slovakia? Or do we have to implement in the second wave of pandemic the same amount of harsh measures that we did implement in the first wave? Yes, thank you for the question. The, uh, the um, measures reflect on uh, epidemiological situation, and this situation is changing every day. As you know, uh, now our, uh, the numbers are rising also in Slovak Republic, as you mentioned, and this is also for us, excuse me, uh, the, um, the situation where, where we need to react. And uh, our government made also a state of emergency uh, at the beginning uh, from the beginning of October uh, for 45 days, as, as you know. But there are also another uh, measures which we uh, ordered or implemented in Slovakia. Uh, I would say these, uh, these baseline measures, uh, which were uh, quite or very, very successful in the first wave, for example, wearing masks as we do today, or uh, social distancing, or even hygiene um, of, of hands. But anyhow, these, uh, these measures were not enough, and we had to start with uh, severe uh, things like, um, uh, like restrictions now, uh, restri restriction in, in, in mass events, for example, in theaters, in sports activities, and so on, wedding, for example. We can say also our prime minister something about it. Um, um, I mean, this is um, this is important to slow down the situation, and we hope that we will be not we will not need to to make a lockdown as we made it uh, in the first wave. So, just to clarify, we should not expect much harsher restrictions or measures in the upcoming days or weeks in Slovakia. Um, I hope not, but of course we have to react on the situation, and the situation right now uh, is under control, and I hope that we will stay uh, open and the, the restrictions will be uh, such as uh, are now. I need to touch on something you said, because you mentioned the Prime Minister of Slovakia, who is very much involved in the entire fighting COVID-19 situation. Uh, do you think that it was wise and it was necessary for him to first step in, try to restrict the, or, or change the restrictive measures, then you had to put them back on because they were necessary, probably? Do you think this is a good idea for a prime minister to step in this way? <laughs> it's a tough question, I have to say, because um, I can't judge uh, every single person. I mean, personally, uh, we as politicians and also also uh, medical staff should be a good example for another ones. And I think that uh, our prime minister regret a little bit also this uh, situation. And what I mean, um, um, the situation a couple of days before was not so severe as it is now. So, I mean, yeah, it was an accident. And I think everyone, uh, uh, everyone knows that uh, he changed his uh, mind and he, he, he wore a uh, mask as well. Yeah, but he was also changing the, the measures that were implemented about the big um, events that he said that they were too restrictive and then they're back on. But I understand you all have your own little <laughs> stake in the puzzle and you're all trying to do what you can. Let's go back to the situation in our hospitals. Um, because, as I mentioned, even the director of the Association of Slovak Hospital, Hospitals said yesterday that his own hospital is severely impacted by the COVID-19, not only by the fact that some of the hospitals do have COVID-19 patients, but also because the, the personnel is falling sick or they have to go into quarantine. How are we handling this? Is there any surge of extra personnel coming? Are we trying to use the army or maybe medicine students, as some, some countries do? Yes, this is a very important question because, I mean, you can have the best plan ever, but when you have not enough uh, personnel, it will be not functioning and you will, be, you will not succeed. So, I mean, this is also one question which we uh, take in, in account and we uh, start to reorganize our hospitals. As you said, we start to reprofilization of our hospitals, some of them since today uh, um, will uh, reduce the planned uh, procedures and we, we have to concentrate ourselves on uh, possible, uh, possible uh, severe uh, outcome of other patients. So this is the one thing uh, we are thinking also 
uh, about uh, working shifts in the hospitals that there there will be uh, some personnel uh, available in case that uh, the first one will be infected, for example. So you mean dividing the hospital personnel into sort of shifts that so they don't meet up and they can work if one yeah, of... I can tell you from my... Um, uh, I'm as, uh, also a doctor, so I, I know how the func is functioning and it is so that when you have a very important doctors in, in your ward, you choose... Uh, 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 you, make, uh, you make two groups, for example, and one group will not touch the another one. And then uh, if something happened, then you can use the, another group to, to help. And of course, state of emergency help us as well to be more flexible to, to react on the situation. And if it will be necessi necessary, then we will move the, uh, the resources where are needed. And one more question. Uh, the rescue workers are saying that they're also reaching capacity and that they lack protective gear. Is it their own business to get the protective gear or should the ministry supply the protective gear for the rescue workers? Uh, what do you mean by uh, protective gear? What, Masks, what do you mean? Uh, gloves. Uh, uh, PPEs, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, I don't have this information, as you said, that uh, that there is a problem. But we have uh, uh, the center where all these uh, all these inquiries are coming, and we are reacting uh, directly when when something happened, and we try to to manage that. We see every day how many people get infected with COVID-19 and how many people get better, how many are healed. And we see the figures daily. Some people say that it might not be the best idea to see the figures daily, maybe just show the weekly average so it evens out the number of tests uh, because some days there's more tests, so obviously there's going to be more infected and some, some days there are less tests. So are we sticking for the moment to the daily informing of the figures of how many people are infected in Slovakia, or shall we maybe switch to the weekly information? <laughs> um, I think I am... Uh, maybe your personal opinion, you're a yeah, doctor, yeah, so... Yeah, I, would, I will tell you. <laughs> um, my uh, personal opinion is that uh, I am uh, less afraid of, of young people who are uh, infected, who are positive, because I think they have a very good chance to, to uh, survive and to, uh, don't need, they don't need uh, uh, any um, health, um, health help, mm -hmm. but um, I'm afraid of uh, vulnerable people, about uh, people who could have a severe, uh, severe problems after that. Um, so um, I'm looking personally. I'm looking on on our hospitals. How are they doing? How many how many uh, beds do we have uh, empty? How many boxes? Because it is also important. It's not imp only important to have uh, ICU unit uh, uh, with uh, with beds, but also how you can uh, how you can um, manage it in in this ICU unit. So I, I'm looking for this uh, this information. This is for me uh, something relevant, and um, not. Not just uh, just uh, just just uh, the number. figures that pop uh, up every day are, yes, in the exactly. newspapers. But the regular people, like regular Slovaks, do see it every day. There's a sort of a stressed atmosphere again, um, as we've seen maybe in the first wave. But then the summer was a rest period in Slovakia as well as in other other European countries. But now we're back in the mode of of looking how many people fall sick. So I was wondering whether it's good for them, for the regular people, to see every day how many more Slovaks are infected. Yeah. Maybe they don't see that there's so many more tests done. So, so if, it's, if it wouldn't be better to just l switch the information dynamic a little bit. I can. I understand your question. I mean, it is, was maybe uh, you too. Uh, at the beginning, you started to, to look to these uh, figures very carefully. And mm -hmm. after that, you, are a little, you were a little bit tired. And you said, OK, this is the situation. I can't change this. Uh, um, and I do all the things which I can. And this is more most important, our personal um, responsibility for uh, ourselves, and but also for another ones. And it is more important than to be concentrated on, on some figures. So we should be looking at the bigger picture rather than the daily Definitely, I would editions. recommend that, yeah. That's the one message for the Slovak people. Yes, and maybe I would say that, yeah. All around uh, other countries in Europe because and they also the, fight the same fight. Yeah, and the other thing we are doing for them, we are trying to, uh, to react very quickly for for people who would be uh, who would have different uh, difficulties maybe for these vulnerable people as I mentioned at the beginning.
Uh, are there enough people who are tracing the context of the infected people because the hygiene and the public health offices are also reaching or surpassing their capacities? How are we going to do with, deal with this? Is anyone coming to help to trace the context, which is very important to rein in the numbers? Yes, um, tracing and testing is a very important uh, part of this play. Um, I mean, with tracing, we, uh, we reached already capacities and that's why we started to, to, uh, uh, to ask our army to help to some public health uh, offices. It will be in next days the reality. Um, How about medicine students? Are they helping? Medical students as well, they, but they will be doing um, mainly um, the testing. Um, and, but I think uh, even it's very important to know what or what kind of testing is necessary. Because I mean, um, as, a, as a medical doctor, you are used to, you get used to that everything what you order, uh, it, it has to have uh, a reason. And um, it is not, uh, uh, just uh, um, suitable to make some tests, for example, just uh, for for this. But you need to you need to know why you are doing this. So we have epidemiological tests. I can understand it that when we track uh, uh, our contacts. But and then we have medical uh, um, medical uh, testing for, um, for example, uh, symptomatic patients. And this is this what I uh, definitely. I want uh, it would be nice that we prioritize this testing mm -hmm. especially for these people who need them because it's not um, it's not that important to know that the young guy is also positive in this situation where we are now but it is much more important to know that uh, our uh, care homes are safe or our uh, our hospitals are safe or our critical personnel um, can cannot be infected so i would recommend and we do all the things to to change uh, also ideas of uh, thinking about uh, testing this way and uh, we are reaching uh, the end of our, our discussion because I know you have to go, but I can't help it, but everyone in the world or many people in the world, this is Globsec, this is a global platform, is looking at the United States of America and that Donald Trump, the president, is sick has been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. He left the hospital after nearly, I think, four days of, uh, in the hospital. He took off his face, face mask. He said he, we can say that in some ways he downplayed the danger of the, of the pandemic, of the disease, saying that in some cases it's less lethal than the flu and that everyone should be fine because everything, everything is rosy, everyone will get through it. Is this responsible leadership in the face of a pandemic? You are a doctor, you, so that's why yes, I'm also asking. But you give me a difficult question. <laughs> I've, 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 I've seen. Um, I'm too small to, to judge President of the United States of America. I haven't seen his uh, medical records. I don't know in, uh, in how condition he, he was. But general, I think uh, we as a politician or, or uh, medical uh, doctors, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are example for another and we should be uh, more uh, uh, we should react uh, carefully and to be responsible. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Peter Stachura, the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Health. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we came to the other part of our panel on the global pandemic. Let me welcome first the person in the studio, who's Robert Mistrik, who's a consultant at HiChem. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And we also have two speakers virtually connected. So let's start with Natalie Moll, who is the Director General of the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, joining us from Brussels. Natalie, good to have you here. Hello, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And we have Francesca Colombo, who's the head of health division at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, joining us at this moment from Paris. Francesca, welcome. Hello. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. Now I see you all two virtually, one right here. So we have to figure out this entire hybrid scene. But this is what we've come to. This is year 2020. So, Mr. Mistrik, let me start with you, please. Uh, you've been listening on uh, to the discussion with, with uh, Mr. Stachura. Uh, he was talking about the preparedness of Slovakia 
for the second wave. I want to touch on the second uh, wave of the pandemic in Slovakia. How is it different than the first one? What should we expect? Well, like in everywhere in the world, we see a fatigue from this uh, pandemic and the people are not so scared anymore. And I'm a scientist and we know uh, we can uh, uh, put in the uh, reality measure what we want, but if the people will not follow the measure, then we may lose the pandemic. And uh, uh, the difference is that the, in the first way, the people were very scared and we all didn't know what, how to deal with the pandemic. And as the pandemic in Slovakia, the first way was uh, quite a low and actually we did a very good job and I believe the Slovakia was one of the best country managing the, the first wave. The people start to think well everything is over and suddenly we have learned that the pandemic is not over and we have uh, climbing numbers. So this is a biggest challenge for us to really understand that this is a very dangerous disease and we should not underestimate it. Well, we try our best and uh, we try to increase the number of uh, tests. Uh, we try to do some public work and explain to people how dangerous this, uh, this pandemic is and to explain how actually to spread the, 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 the virus. So it is uh, very important to put a barrier between uh, human and, uh, and virus. The barrier is, for example, the face mask. Another barrier is social distance. So we should not meet the people we were used to meet every time. And this is uh, another very important factor of this pandemic. The third one is uh, what we know also from, uh, uh, from life sciences. So the, the human is organized in a cells. So we don't have everything in one uh, object. So we have a cells. And what I mean with it, the, 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 the nature very smartly try to differentiate various parts of, uh, of uh, functional things in organisms. And therefore, we say uh, in this pandemic, it is very important to self-isolate. So to create uh, islands uh, uh, and not to meet together in one space, because this is a very good ground for uh, spreading the virus. So this, this basic, I wouldn't say uh, scientific uh, principles, but these basic principles of life, we should also apply uh, in managing uh, the pandemic. You're also a member of the task force that tackles the pandemic in Slovakia. It's in effect right now, again. Um, we were discussing with the state secretary whether it's necessary to show the daily numbers of, of infected people, whether it should, wouldn't be more precise or accurate to show maybe the weekly averages. So, so it's a little bit more um, leveled out. We don't see daily, but we see sort of a one weekly figure for, for the Slovak people to see how we're doing. Well, I believe we should be transparent. So everybody in the world is showing the daily numbers. Why shouldn't we show the numbers? So it's uh, very important for, for public and also for experts to see in which situation we are currently. So the, this is actually the, 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 the basic information we need to know. Of course, this is not the only number. Some people are really criticizing. So we focus too much on one number. This is the daily uh, uh, increase. Uh, increase or daily number of uh, infected people. There is uh, uh, many more information behind this number, so we also need to follow the dynamic. Uh, we have, uh, have to follow this uh, R0. We have to follow also this uh, now so that's a quite known uh, K factor, so how quickly it spreads and so on. So there are uh, a lot of uh, things we should also be. Well, I give you an example. I, I can remember from uh, communistic time uh, when somebody was diagnosed with a cancer, so it was not disclosed to the patients. So I don't know why this was so so irrational. Wait, so someone was diagnosed with a uh, yeah, cancer so, diagnosis? Yeah, and it was not disclosed to the patient, so <laughs> we could see on only uh, CA uh, letters so that uh, somehow the, the doctors can communicate. And today, when you, you somebody tell it, this, he said, this is a nonsense, it doesn't make sense. And therefore, this is not to disclose the numbers <laughs> of uh, daily, 
infected people would remind me on this uh, communistic system of hiding if somebody was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, no, I'm not saying hiding them altogether, maybe just making them into an average so we, we count for the number of tests because regular Slovaks, they see how many people are infected, but some of them don't look at the number of tests carried out so that more the tests, the more tests, more infections. But I understand your standpoint. Well, uh, we all know that uh, the actual number is higher, so it's everywhere in mm. the world, so nobody knows uh, the fact so if we say, well, we have a, a thousand uh, infected uh, in a certain day, uh, how uh, many people in absolute numbers are actually infected in this country? So the, the factors vary between three to ten, so nobody knows uh, what is uh, certain. So we have to do uh, as many tests as uh, required so that uh, the ratio of positive to the total number of, of tests is not uh, too high. And so that's, that's important. Thank you. Let's join in with our speakers online. Uh, because we were talking about Slovakia doing very well in the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, let's discuss, Francesca, let's discuss the Central European region and how they dealt with the pandemic, second wave now and the first wave as well, compared, for instance, to the Western countries. We see there's a lot of things happening all around the world, but how would you place the Central European region in the fight with the pandemic? Yes, sure. I mean, uh, you're right. We need to distinguish the first wave from what is happening now. And it's quite clear that during the first wave, the Central and also Eastern European were pretty much spared from some of the worst impacts that we have seen in some of the other um, in, in some of the other European countries. And there are probably many reasons behind it. One very important one, which would be fundamental for me also moving forward, so with the second waves or until we're out of uh, this uh, uh, pandemic, is really the, the ability to act in very, very early stages. What happened during the first wave is that there were in those countries the implementation of uh, control and mitigation measures that was done early on. If we look at the time that those measures were implemented, it's the same time as other Western European countries, but other Western European countries were already much more affected in terms of having the virus really circulated and very, very large number of people being infected. And so, in a way, Central and European uh, countries acted early before the uh, pandemic was uh, com completely out of control, and that was fundamental. Uh, there were not also like super spreader events that might have uh, been affecting the dynamics of the pandemic in Western European uh, uh, countries. And uh, in a way also the country, Central European countries had perhaps a bit less of uh, contact with some of the other parts uh, of the world. I think the critical issues though will be now, because now we see uh, clearly a resurgence in, uh, in infections. And we know that also Central European countries have also fewer resources. There's a question of uh, have we kept up really with continuous investment, which for us is fundamental in uh, robust uh, tracking and robust tracing strategies. So not just the testing, but really following up to all those uh, people who have been in contact and very quickly and very effectively isolated. That would be really, really fundamental. Thank you. Um, now is the time to remind you here in the room, if anyone wanted to ask a question, you're more than welcome. Just please catch my eye and we'll deal with it. Let's move on with the discussion. Um, I know it's a bit of a detour, but I think it needs to be covered. You're public health experts, all of you. There's a scientist, there's a person who, does, who deals with medicine, who is from the OECD Health Division. How do you see President Trump handling uh, his diagnosis and his behavior after being diagnosed, also his public statements about the COVID-19. Natalie? <laughs> That's an interesting question, Veronica. Um, I, I've known a few people who've been affected by this virus, unfortunately, who've been in intensive care for two weeks. Um, and of course, any communication that you make as a citizen is already extremely important as we heard in the speeches before mine as well as by Dr. Tedros. We can only fight this if we all do this together, if we're solidaire, if we're careful together, protect ourselves and protect others. 
So of course, as a public figure, I think you have even more responsibility to communicate in the best possible way to ensure that everybody is solidar and um, protecting themselves, also to protect others. I think that's as much as I can say, and uh, not being in any position of power like uh, President Trump, it's obviously difficult to um, put myself Thank you. in Thank you, no, we, we understand. Thank you, we appreciate it. Mr. Mistrik, you're a scientist. Um, how do you see his comments saying that in some cases uh, the COVID-19 is less lethal than the flu, that people should not be too worried, that it can be overcome rather easily? Well, scientifically, the, uh, the COVID-19 is uh, like 10 times more lethal than, uh, than a normal flu, so that's, that the data are showing it. So, well, we should stick to the, to the data, not to our uh, impressions or whatever is spread on the Internet. Because it's very interesting that uh, people are saying different things and some people are prone to listen to rather different interpretation than those of scientists, mm -hmm. than those of, of experts in the public health field. Well, we are sometimes fooled by uh, so-called uh, small, small numbers examples. So we all naturally tend to generalize things that happen to us. So mm -hmm. if I have a good experiences with the uh, with the honey, then I would say, well, honey is a medicine for everything. So, but as a scientist, we we know we have to uh, rely on a large studies. So, like when you are testing new drugs, you need uh, studies on several thousand people, because we know if the, the the sample size is small, then we can be really misleaded, but uh, by wrong uh, results. And uh, therefore, uh, we are now over nine months collecting epidemiological data, so we know more about this, uh, this disease, so these results appearing in a scientific literature. So, so therefore, we have to uh, take our sources from these uh, reliable uh, journals and uh, scientists and judge based on this information but not what happened to my neighbor or to what happened to my friends and so on, because this is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, one of the Globseg megatrends that they observed was that um, there's an interesting and an immense spread of misinformation between um, people in, uh, in different countries of the world, and they are prone, as I mentioned, to believe not the scientific, not the factual data, but more something that fits them in their maybe world perspective. Francesca, is the OECD aware of this and is it trying to somehow dissipate the myths that are out there in the public arena? Yes, of course. I mean, you're right. There is issues about information, which uh, is a problem because it creates mistrust uh, as well in the sense that if we are not able to say which information is uh, um, the true information, uh, if we're not able to distinguish, then that creates confusions among the populations and it lowers the trust into what governments have been doing. So, of course, we have been trying uh, to help by producing all sorts of different uh, reports, briefs uh, around different aspects of managing uh, the crisis, not just in health, but also in society and, uh, and economy. And I think there is a fundamental issues that we need to really address in how to, to build better channels of uh, trust for uh, populations, making sure that the information that is communicated is obviously very, very clear, but also making sure that uh, you know, there are appropriate mechanisms uh, so that we, we reduce the risk that populations might be um, lost in a way. We need to have transparency about the strategies that uh, governments are putting in place, why there are certain uh, strategies, uh, think about uh, testing and importance, uh, think about the use of masks. There was at the beginning quite a lot of uh, um, confusions about whether masks should be worn or not. So there needs to be a quite clear communicated uh, information, but also trying to uh, avoid possible conflict of interest between different uh, parties, uh, you know, whether governments, researchers, uh, even the pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, uh, making sure that there are very communi good communications about how, at the moment in which we'll have the vaccines that will be um, distributed. So what are the fairness criteria? You know, so in a way, building on those channels of trust for the populations would be quite fundamental moving forward.
Many of the myths that are being out there are about the vaccine. Um, Natalie, what's the state on the current vaccines? You represent the European um, pharmaceutical industry. How are we doing with the vaccines? Um, I'm using the example of Slovakia, where less than 50% people said in a survey that they're willing to get vaccinated because they don't believe that it's safe. And because it's developed in a speedy fashion, um, they think that it's not safe and they refuse to get the vaccine once it's out. I know this is Slovakia, but I've seen similar surveys in the UK. So how to fight this and where are we with the vaccine? Some of it was mentioned by Tedros, but let's expand on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Veronica. So in, indeed, um, Mr. Mr. Tredros explained uh, the number of vaccines uh, being developed and um, the ones that are already in clinical trials, there are over 30 of them who are already being in clinical trials, which means they're being tested. And a number of them um, should be, so there are three cl clinical trial phases. At the end of the third clinical trial phase, then you can ascertain um, the safety of a product and then you submit the dossier for approval to a regulatory body, be it a uh, regional one like the European Union or national ones. No products are ever uh, put on the market without having a regulatory approval. So I think that's very important and it's a very difficult concept to share in the general public because in general, everything that we buy has not been approved by a regulatory body, right? So if you buy a phone, a computer, whatever, that's not the case. So very few people know that products like medicinal products have to be tested very rigorously before they are able to reach the market in any shape or form. Um, and I think that that's a question of communication that we have to do as an industry, that the media has to do as an intermediary, that politicians, that regulators, we all have to participate in increasing the level of knowledge about how a medicine or a vaccine reaches the market to help uh, reassure the general public that just like any other vaccine um, or any other healthcare product, safety is the number one priority. Um, so I think by the end of this year, we should have some results of phase three clinical trials, uh, after which then the products will have to be um, reviewed. The two are already being reviewed by the European Medicines Agency while the clinical trials are ongoing. So a number of regulatory adaptations uh, of the highest level, of the most modern level, have been put in place to deal to uh, speed up the review, but the uh, criteria of the review remain exactly the same. So the stringency of the safety is exactly the same. There have been no changes in terms of what is required of this vaccine compared to other vaccines. And I think that's a very important message to pass. It's not an easy one. It's a technical one. It's a scientific one. It's one that is very far away from the general public's you know, day to day dealing with commodities that you buy. And so it really requires a careful communication uh, by, like I mentioned, all actors and not just the industry, of course. Uh, do we have any date in mind when people in Europe could first get the vaccine? Is there any, any estimate? You said that by the end of the year, there should be some uh, in end of phase three results. Yeah, that's always the question that we get indeed. <laughs> Not surprising. Science, you mentioned it as well. No, it's right. And I'm a scientist as well. And the issue with science is that you never know what happens when you do an experiment. So the clinical trials are, if you like, tests of, to see how safe a product is. If all things go well, at some point next year, we should be able to have uh, vaccines for priority categories first and then for the general public but you don't know what happens um, in a clinical trial because it's a scientific trial. So it's, it's difficult to foresee, unfortunately, and I think we all are dying to know. Thank you very much. Um, the OECD says that in order for the vaccine to so-called end the pandemic, 50 to 75 percent of the population should be vaccinated. As we see from the survey in Slovakia, for instance, or the survey done in the UK, um, it might be less than 50 percent. Uh, Mr. Mistrik, is it still effective? Will the vaccine still do its job if it's less than 50% of people getting it? Well, I have heard several other numbers. So some say, well, 30% is enough. Uh, you mentioned different numbers. It also depends uh, from the neighboring countries. So Slovakia is not an isolated island. So we're 
what we do will not affect us, we will not affect our neighbors and vice versa. So I would now not speculate about how much uh, the, the vaccination should go far. Uh, well, it's important to persuade as many people as possible. So, well, I have all possible vaccinations in my body because I believe in vaccination mm -hmm. on my family as well. So, and we should set this uh, example. So, well, uh, yes, because this anti-vaxxer uh, movement started with a fake uh, article in a uh, respected uh, scientific journals, and actually we were ignoring it for many, many years, and suddenly we have seen the impact uh, how uh, it affected many people. So this is this uh, famous uh, uh, article that uh, vaccination uh, cause uh, autism, which is a totally nonsense, but it spreads uh, It has everywhere. since been disproved, uh, but... Yeah, of course, so it spread everywhere, and now we have to face this, uh, this problem. So, therefore, uh, we have to persuade everybody that it is, uh, this is uh, very uh, beneficial, it's safe, and uh, it is beneficial for society and is best beneficial for myself, for an individual. So, therefore, the people probably more believe <laughs> in self uh, effects than uh, effects on the society. So, therefore, we should use th uh, these arguments as well. Let's talk about the quantities, the numbers of the vaccines. There's talk that there's not going to be enough for certain countries. Central Europe generally puts m less money into innovative treatments than, than uh, the Western Europe. Will we have enough vaccines? Do you think first, Mr. Mr. Mistrik, and then I'll take it out to you, ladies, once they're available, even here in Slovakia, which is a relatively small country. Well, I believe the problem is more complex. So this is not a vaccine itself. So it needs to be bottled. So it needs to be distributed. Uh, in, it needs to be uh, applicated and so on. So this is a whole infrastructure which is uh, associated with the vaccination. Uh, it depends uh, which type of vaccine will be actually the, the right one, because we know we have uh, now approximately four type of vaccine. Some are very easy to produce, some are more difficult to produce, so we will see which type of vaccine we will finally get. And well, there are some uh, some some news that even the glass bottles may be a problem. So th this may be a bottleneck. But uh, well, I will not speculate right now. So uh, how many vaccine we will get or the entire world. But I am quite optimistic because there are really many uh, companies uh, uh, doing a very good progress on, a, on a clinical trials and we will see. Um, Francesca, I'm turning to you. Is the OECD doing anything or giving any uh, particular guidelines on how to fairly distribute the vaccine between countries, between nations that need it? Well, we have been, uh, yes, doing uh, a bit of work. I think there is a, the fundamental issues that was mentioned also by Pedro is that nobody will be safe enough until, you know, in a way, the entire world and population is safe. So I think between the moment in which we find one, hopefully more than one, you know, multiple vaccines, and the moment in which we can say we are out of the pandemic, uh, it's going to be a long, long um, process not just because of the things that uh, was mentioned by the state secretary. Obviously, we need to make sure that there is manufacturing capacity. We need to make sure that people then are vaccinated. We need to make sure that um, the vaccines which are produced are distributed, but also because there's these questions about uh, fair uh, distributions uh, across countries. And I think there are lots of things that can be done, but certainly this call for much more robust international corporations in, uh, in addressing the issues of uh, um, distributions of, uh, of vaccine and ensuring that those are made available to where the needs are the, the highest. And so, you know, obviously there are already initiatives, even within Europe, uh, there is an emergency and emergency support instruments that tries to ensure that there is sufficient volume of uh, doses of vaccines which are available for the European Union um, as a whole and then uh, distributed across countries. So, in a way, getting countries together uh, within Europe to make sure that there are common discussions, but also common negotiations, making sure that there are uh, purchasing, joint purchasing uh, arrangements that are put in place, 
That is one way forward. At international level, there are initiatives like the COVID um, initiative that is really an initiative for joint purchasing and fair distributions of uh, doses of, uh, of vaccine. Um, I think it's not just a matter of uh, altruism uh, relative to you know, other countries that might be suffering more. I think it's also an economic issues because uh, unless we address the pandemics in all the parts of the world, there will be a knock-on impact also across the globe uh, in terms of uh, the economies and, and societies. So I think continuing to work to ensure there are those uh, uh, arrangements, I would say that probably we can go a little bit farther in terms of sharing of the risk, not just uh, having joint uh, procurement arrangement, but also arrangement that share the risks uh, arrangements uh, that allow to have advanced commitments that give certainties to companies about the type of uh, um, uh, products that will be uh, that will be purchased, those products that they, that they develop, provided they are successful and provided they have certain criteria. Uh, so I think there are quite a lot of things that can be done to ensure that we decide upfront how we will reward the uh, successful products which have certain criteria. Um, in, in terms of uh, effectiveness, in terms of uh, pricing uh, as well, but also that we uh, agree on how to make, to make sure that those are distributed uh, where the needs are the highest within a country and across countries. Thank you very much. Natalie, I would like to turn to you now. Uh, how about the funding for the vaccine development? How about the healthcare spending of uh, different countries? that are trying to, to get the vaccines, they're trying to get not only the vaccines, but the treatments for COVID-19. Uh, we are in the second wave. Uh, I think it was Francesca who said that even the funds are running out. How to deal with this? How to, how to uh, maybe restructure the healthcare spending, spending how to fund um, the various countries' needs for medicine? Yeah, thank you for the question, Veronica, because I think this is really a huge opportunity in every challenge, right? There's an opportunity. Um, we need to really look at our healthcare systems that um, are incredibly stretched right now, but we're already in a difficult state before, particularly in, in uh, Central and Eastern European countries, and make sure that we learn from this uh, crisis and we manage to reinforce them in the right way and we focus on the right things. Uh, so really implement a very ambitious reform agenda for European health systems. I'm very proud of the way Europe is acting in this crisis. The solidarity has come through, the organization for the vaccines purchasing, as, as um, before was mentioned by Francesca, but also the participation in COVAX, so not only for Europe, but also beyond Europe. So these are all um, incredible things. but they need to be long lasting. So indeed, we need to look at how we can better organize our healthcare systems, how we can do this in a durable way. The first area, which is really important, is digital approaches to healthcare delivery. I mean, if anything, if we learned anything from this crisis is that at the moment we are unable even to calculate to compare the number of deaths of COVID. So how are we going to be able to strengthen uh, primary care and uh, the digitization of healthcare? It really has to be uh, one of the focuses if we want to be more resilient in the future. We also need to think about the financing of healthcare systems. At the moment, there are silos between all the different healthcare budgets, and we need to integrate those silos, health and social care as well, and novel payment schemes to optimize how we use our money and to get rid of any waste. I think the OECD estimates 20% of waste in healthcare systems. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, this is really an opportunity for us to learn from one another, to implement um, the right uh, approaches in healthcare systems so that at the moment healthcare systems in Central and Eastern European countries that which often are up to 3% of the GDP less uh, funded than, than the top five countries in Europe manage to catch up so that the outcomes for patients are better at the end of the day because that's what we're all interested in is how patients fare in those countries. Mr. Mistrik, uh, this is what Natalie Mall said are we going to go that way in Slovakia? Are we going to restructure? Would you recommend restructure some of the healthcare systems in place in order maybe to better fight the pandemics in the future? <laughs> well, I believe every government is constantly talking about restructuring and reforms and so on because uh, healthcare system is uh, very costly 
and uh, the people tend to be not very satisfied with the healthcare system, at least in our region. Uh, well, there are, uh, of course, talks uh, how we will do reforms also in healthcare. And however, right now we have the, the primary goal to, to manage uh, this, uh, this pandemic, which uh, with growing numbers is actually what we have to do every day. And of course, once the pandemic is over, so we have to really, as, as was said by my colleagues, uh, we have to learn from this crisis and maybe do a better setup of, uh, of our healthcare system. Uh, you are a member of the task force, the task force that was handling and is handling the pandemic in Slovakia. I have a quick question. Do you look into, for inspiration into other countries? Because we know the Czech Republic is doing very, very badly at the moment. I believe they're worst off in the European Union. But are there any inspirations we're drawing from outside of Slovakia? Well, I don't know a scientist who is not looking for inspiration outside his laboratory, outside his country. So the first, what the scientist is doing when he tries to manage a complex problem is look in the literature. So of course, you're always looking for inspiration. And since this was totally new for us, we all were on a search for inspiration and for solution how the probably the, the Asian countries were dealing with the, with the pandemic. Yes, we are looking for inspiration also outside our <laughs> bubble. Yeah, but not one specific country that we're being modeled after. Uh, well, um, that's what I, you know, what I was you are always looking for a solution that works. So uh, we are not, uh, I would say, chauvinistic. So we believe that <laughs> only one country has the right. So it's, the problems are too complex. So, uh, well, we, we, we learn fr from each other. So, and, well, uh, just on the, this topic, so I have read uh, an interview with uh, Karl Lauterbach, who is a uh, SPD uh, member of parliament for in uh, German uh, Bundestag and he said well uh, the, the crisis in Germany was therefore so well managed because the, the Angela Merkel and all the people in, in government were listening to the scientists and the decisions were scientifically based so that's that is so something we should aim for. This is something, and I believe in Slovakia was the same case. So from the first point on, the, our prime minister surrounded himself with the expert, with the scientists, and so on. And the scientific insight was was very important. So and still is the same way that was during. Yeah, the first it is. Wave? It is still the same way. So therefore, this would be my primary inspiration: where well, listen to the relevant people. And I have the last question for all of you. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, the last question is maybe very um, naive or, or simple or however you call it, but I am here to ask the questions for the regular people. So when do you each see the end of this pandemic happening? Francesca, please, let's start with you. <laughs> Look, it's a big question. As I said, I don't think it will be when we're going to have just a vaccine because we will need obviously to make sure that the production is rolled, that we, uh, people will be immunized and, and so forth, so that will take quite a bit, uh, a bit of time. Um, incredibly difficult at the moment to really put uh, a date, because it all depends really on uh, how fast and quickly uh, we're going to succeed on the innovation uh, front. Uh, so I think it, it will take quite a lot of time, but it will also depend on how uh, well you know, countries and individuals uh, can manage the non, uh, also pharmaceutical, the non-medical um, interventions that we have at our disposals right now. So it's hand washing with the tracing, uh, tracking, um, testing, and you know isolating, uh, which I mentioned. You know all those non-pharma interventions, which at the moment is are the tools that we have. I think there is a wider issues about will it ever end. I think. There is a fundamental question of asking what can we learn from the crisis to really, uh, you know, ensure that we are better ready for any future crisis, but really raise also the, the quality, the effectiveness, uh, the resilience of our health systems. So perhaps in, from that perspective, it's going to be a process that will continue forever. We need to have very humble, uh, we need to be very humble to really recognize that there are certain things that could have been done perhaps differently, 
and keep this as a process for our continuous learning so that we have much stronger and more resilient health system for the future. So there is one issue of when the pandemic per se will finish and be out and there's a question of you know, continuing that conversation going and not forgetting even when we are out of the, uh, perhaps of the risk, uh, not to stop the conversations about uh, making our health systems much more resilient. Continue you, that into the future. Very quickly, very briefly, because we're running out of time. When will the pandemic end or will it ever end? What's your opinion? So I couldn't have said it better than uh, Francesca. So I'm not going to repeat what she said, to be honest, Veronica. I think she said it very well. It's a personal and global responsibility. It's all based on collaboration and on science. And I think that we need to be honest in our communication and all participate in that. Um, what I wanted to also mention very quickly is you said money is running out. In fact, I don't think so. There are some new proposed European actions like EU for Health, there are European structural investment funds. If we can channel all of these to help make more resilient healthcare systems, I think we will have succeeded somewhere where we have failed so far. And we really hope that the ambitious plan proposed by the Commission, which was around 9 billion for the EU for Health, is um, reinstated and we can rely on that at member state level to make us more resilient. Thank you. Is there anything you want to ask, Mr. Mistrik? Well, about these predictions, uh, long-term predictions are very difficult and usually they fail so, because you cannot predict events that will happen in a short time. And the world is full of surprises and, you know, there is some kind of a joke, but this is a really true. So, uh, or unlikely things very unlikely things happen very often because there are billions of unlikely things and these sayings make any prediction uh, very difficult if not impossible so we can predict what will happen probably in one month but we can hardly predict what will happen in in one year Thank you very much. I didn't really honestly expect any more specific answers, but thank you very much, all three of you, for trying. Uh, we've reached the end of this session. We are on to refreshments, which are now available downstairs. And the next session is here at 2 p.m. And it's all about post-COVID cooperation. And at the same time, in the Habsburg room, which is next door, is the subject 5G. I may remind you, and I need to remind you, because we are being COVID safe. Please, everyone who is here in Bratislava, wear masks anytime you're not eating or drinking outside of this room inside this room and now please let me thank our panelists let me thank Francesca Colombo from the OECD thank you very much Francesca thank you Natalie Moll from the EFPIA -E thank you and thank you Mr. Mystery a consultant at HiCamp okay thank you and thank you